so, so Hawking's uh, original paradox from 40 years ago um, revealed the conflict between quantum mechanics and, and our understanding of space-time. Um, Hawking proposed that more or less space-time is fine, but quantum mechanics breaks down. Information is lost in a way that implies that pure states evolve to mixed states in a way that doesn't happen in quantum mechanics. Around 20 years later, the modern point of view developed for starting with some sort of general reasoning, oops, and then, um, and then uh, capped off with gauge gravity duality, namely information is not lost, quantum mechanics is not modified. However, space-time locality is emergent. It's not fundamental. Space-time is holographic, drastically non-local. Um, but there was also a widespread assumption that this non-locality was subtle and wouldn't be seen in ordinary circumstances by um, a, a, any single observer inside or outside the black hole. This was formalized as black hole complementarity. So about two years ago, um, in two years ago, uh, it was argued that, in fact, things are not so nice for space-time. If quantum mechanics is to be preserved, and if the non-locality is not extending far outside the black hole, then, in fact, uh, space-time is drastically modified once you reach the horizon. Uh, an infalling observer will meet a firewall of high-energy particles, or perhaps even the end of space. And so it's interesting that most of the new ideas that have arisen since that time um, try to escape this by modifying quantum mechanics. Now, uh, you, first think, you first might ask, uh, don't we already know that this doesn't work? Doesn't ADS, CFT um, you know, tell us that quantum mechanics is fine? And these modifications are different from Hawking's, whereas Hawking's modification is something that would, have been, would be visible to an observer at infinity. These modifications affect only the experience of the infalling observer, or, or maybe, more precisely, the relation between the experience of the infalling observer and uh, the, as, uh, the asymptotic observer. So I've kind of summarized this history with this pendulum. Uh, first, Hawking had the pendulum swinging, to, swinging toward GR surviving uh, with, um, with ADS-CFT. Uh, it swung towards QM quantum mechanics surviving, but space-time becoming emergent. Uh, with AMPS, the firewall argument, it maybe swung too far uh, towards space-time breaking down rather drastically, and according to these ideas, it has, is perhaps swinging back to something in the middle where both space-time and quantum mechanics give a bit. And if this is true, it certainly needs to be understood. It's an important thing to understand about the nature of quantum gravity. And so the main theme of my talk is, in fact, to talk about why it's necessary to modify quantum mechanics in this approach. Um, the different approach, uh, proposals for modifying quantum mechanics and, and what their issues are. So uh, the first, oh, first some references. So I, I should have titled this slide, The Defenders of Quantum Mechanics, uh, because the original AMS papers and follow-up papers by Busso and Harlow uh, both sharpen the original AMS argument, but also sharpen the nature of the quantum mechanics violation in these alternative ideas. And as I go along, of course, there'll be, there'll be more references. So the first part of my talk is just a review to set the stage, uh, black hole evaporation, the information problem, and the firewall argument. OK, so um, for most of the talk, this is what a black hole, oops, what a black hole looks like. It's not your usual conformal diagram. Um, um, this is, I guess, Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates. But um, so, so you have, if you're, if you're studying quantum field theory in the neighborhood of a black hole, um, if you're an asymptotic observer, it's natural to expand the fields um, in, in terms of uh, modes of fixed Schwarzschild frequency. Um, but of course, because there's a horizon, uh, these don't cover the whole space. You need a second set of, so B. B is, throughout this talk, B is your outgoing Hawking mode. B prime is the other set of modes that you need to complete, 
to describe the field in the rest of the space. Actually, on a conformal diagram, both B and B prime are right moving. There are also left moving modes, and, and there are gray body factors, meaning that there's reflection of right into left. But it's simplest in the presentation to ignore that and just focus on, for the most part, and just focus on these modes that are right moving on the conformal diagram. But of course, for an infalling observer, this would, it would be unnatural to use a set of modes that, 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 that is defined with this sharp um, bifurcation at the horizon. It would be more natural to use a set of modes uh, that cross it smoothly, modes in, say, the Kruskal time frequency. And so there's a relation between these two sets of modes. And because the relation of time here and here is nonlinear, because this gravit because basically what's a finite time for the infilling observer is an infinite time for the asymptotic observer, uh, these frequencies are not the same, and there's a mixing of modes, and in particular, a mixing of raising and lowering operators. Now, for the infilling observer, notice I, the, one, the reason I'm drawing these coordinates and not conformal coordinates is simply that this picture emphasizes something that you could show more, more fully with equations, which is that these modes, as you look at them earlier and earlier in time, are being scrunched onto the horizon. They are at higher and higher frequency, uh, meaning that they better not be excited. There's no way for them to get excited. Uh, the adiabatic principle says, since nothing too dramatic has happened in their past that these modes have to be in their ground state. And if these modes are in their ground state, then the modes B and B prime, although they're together in a pure state, they're entangled and, and separately they're excited. So B is excited with some kind of thermal spectrum, and that's the Hawking radiation. So this, this introduces you to the notation and gives you a quick derivation of Hawking radiation. Now, the information problem, so, so there's, there's a very nice visual way to think about it, which is this, the, the, which was emphasized by Don Page. Uh, so this is a plot over the lifetime of the black hole of, of various entropies. Actually, there are three entropies on this same slide. The first is the von Neumann entropy of the Hawking radiation. Um, as the Hawking particles are emitted, they're entangled with the, the black hole. At each step of the evaporation, you so B is entangled with B prime. At each step of the evaporation, um, the, the entanglement therefore goes up. Each, each successive mode that's emitted is entangled with the black hole. And so the Hawking calculation says that uh, the entanglement entropy between the radiation and the black hole rises steadily over the life of the black hole. And necessarily, this is equal to two other things. Uh, the first is, of course, the entanglement entropy means that, 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 well, sorry, the von Neumann entropy means, again, that the, the Hawking radiation is not in a pure state. It's not pure because it's entangled with the black hole. And so the second coincident curve is the entanglement entropy between the radiation and the black hole. And the third coincident curve is, is the von Neumann entropy of the black hole itself, uh, which, again, is, well, assuming the system starts in or reasonably close to a pure state, uh, these three entropies have to be equal. Now, once the evaporation completes, uh, two of those curves are irrelevant because the black hole is not there, and one is just left with the uh, entanglement, the, the von Neumann entropy of the Hawking radiation, which is large, meaning that the entire system, the Hawking radiation is all there is, is now in a mixed state. Um, and that's, that's Hawking's argument for evolution from pure to mixed states. Uh, it's interesting to contrast this with another curve, which is the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole. The black hole starts out, oops, starts out big, sorry, starts out big and, um, and um, ends up small. So the Bekenstein Hawking entropy is going down. Um, and they cross around the midpoint of the life of the black hole. And that's interesting because the Bekenstein Hawking entropy is supposed to be the coarse grained entropy the thermodynamic entropy, whereas this is the fine-grained entropy. And if a black hole is an ordinary thermodynamic object, the fine-grained entropy can't exceed the coarse-grained entropy. And so the problem uh, arises not at the end of the life of the black hole, but already at the midpoint. 
if, if in fact, first of all, if in fact information is not to be lost, if pure, if, if pure states are to evolve to pure states, the actual entanglement entropy has to go up and then down again, and it has to start going down by the midpoint, uh, first by this argument, and second just by counting the sort of number of photons it would take to encode the information. Um, and and um, so um, that's the page curve, which kind of follows Hawking halfway and Bekenstein Hawking for the second half. Um, and uh, Page nicely argued, it's not at all essential for anything I say because, well, it's not essential for anything I say, um, but Page nicely argued that if the black hole is a chaotic system, as we kind of expect from dual descriptions, uh, then one actually follows these two curves quite closely, rising with Hawking for the first half and then falling uh, with the coarse rate entropy for the second. Now, there's a nice sharpening of this argument um, due to Samir um, using, using um, strong subjectivity of entanglement entropy. So there are, this refers to three systems. Uh, the, two, the three systems are, first of all, two that we've talked about already, the outgoing Hawking photon and the one it's entangled with. And then um, for the purpose of this immediate discussion, E, the third subsystem, is all prior Hawking photons. This is necessary for, so the first thing, uh, before, I, before I make it sharp, the thing to emphasize is this is an order one problem. This is an order one problem. This, this, this entropy is going up more or less as rapidly as it can. It has to fall as rapidly as it can. To get from here to here is not a small correction. It's an order one correction. And, and um, a sharpening of this, again, we talk about these three subsystems, D, B prime, and the earlier radiation up until D. Um, and um, subjectivity says if you look at various subsystems, you have an inequality of the entropies. So, um, and now we're going to use the fact that, that B and B prime are in a pure state. The state of B and B prime is this vacuum for the infalling observer. So they're in a pure state. And with, uh, with that um, additional information, this inequality uh, simplifies to this one. So what this says is the, the von Neumann entropy of the EB system together um, is, is greater than or equal to the sum of the von Neumann entropy of, of E and B. And now again, the von Neumann entropy of B is non-zero because it's entangled with B prime because it's in a thermal state. And so this inequality is giving you the Hawking curve. Basically, the page curve would require that somehow uh, SBE be more or less S sub B minus S sub B so you're really way off. Um, by the way, black gray body factors, the fact that B sometimes reflects in, reduces the magnitude of S sub B, but doesn't change the, the uh, nature of the mismatch. Before I go on, I want to mention something which won't play a big role, but it's worth knowing, which is um, on this slide, all I've done is, is, is make E, the set E, somewhat smaller. So instead of consisting of all prior photons, it just consists of, of a half plus a few more. And this is a nice insight from quantum information theory uh, due to Hayden and Preskill, namely if, um, if the black hole, again, is chaotic, if, uh, if, if it's a chaotic quantum system, then in order to have um, the necessary entanglements, it's not necessary to capture every single prior Hawking photon but just half of the total plus a few more. Now, um, I want to point out a nice thing about this Mathur argument. Uh, when you read discussions of why the information problem is a problem, there's very often a focus on a, a space-like slice. That's a space-like slice in this coordinate system, the green slice, uh, which, which extends deep into the black hole and which which captures all of the earlier Hawking photons. And, 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 and sometimes the paradox is, is described as, as, you know, as um, you know, in terms of thinking about the, the state of this entire slice, which suggests, and of course, no single observer can see this entire slice, which is one of the origins of the idea of black hole complementarity. If to, if to have a conflict, uh, you need to talk about the state of this whole slice, then by restricting in some way the question the, the size of the Hilbert space to what a single observer can see, it seems like you might escape this. But the Mathur argument emphasizes that there is already a problem at the horizon. That is, or rather just behind the horizon, 
uh, if you simply talk about this single mode B prime. And from there, it's really one step, one short step to the AMPS argument, namely, um, in contrast to um, the, the um, um, earlier, well, in, uh, the, the, a single observer, a single inflowing observer um, can see uh, all three of these subsystems, can see the early radiation and these two entangled modes. And so in contrast to, to sort of earlier thought experiments that, that were used to support this idea that of, of logical complementarity, um, the, the, um, you can't escape it here. If, if this poor fellow has uh, a, a quantum mechanical description, a normal quantum mechanical description, uh, and if nothing non-local happens outside the black hole, if information is not lost, then the entanglement between B and B prime has to be lost. And, and um, um, in that case, again, as this picture reminds you, these modes are at high frequency. It implies that we're very far from the A vacuum. There are modes with a high level of excitation. Now, I want to give next a different version of this argument, which is, well, a little more ads cft ish and maybe see a little bit more, might seem more robust. But um, suppose, so, so this is another version of the firewall argument, which implicitly has met the same assumptions, but looks rather different in form. So I want to put the black hole, a black hole, in a big box. A box which I think it's useful to think about the box as being quite a bit larger than the black hole, but still small enough that the black hole is stable, small enough that the outgoing radiation reflects off the walls and falls back in before the lifetime of the black hole. So uh, again, and this box uh, is naturally ADS space. And if we consider now typical high energy states of quantum gravity and anti sitter space, they look like black holes. That's what thermodynamic, that's what thermal equilibrium is in, in, um, in quantum gravity. And now I want to take the states of this system, and I want to use a basis, which is just an eigenbasis of the number operator for these Hawking modes B. Now, earlier I used Schwarzschild frequency to, to, for these modes. Um, that sharp modes and frequency require integrating over infinite time, and you, know, you may not want to do that for a variety of reasons. So you can imagine these modes being um, narrow in frequency, but finite in time extent over some period of time outside the black hole. The details there won't matter too much. But now, um, there's this, okay, you have this base, and this number operator, if we're in the A vacuum, this num any, if we're in the A vacuum, this number operator, this number operator um, has a thermal distribution. B is entangled with B prime, and so B by itself has a, a thermal distribution. Um, and therefore, all of, these, all of these eigenstates, which are not, in which, in which the distribution is not thermal, but rather a delta function on some value, all of these eigenstates are far from the A vacuum. Each of the modes that would be seen by an infalling observer is excited with probability of order a half, and so every single state in this basis has a firewall. Now, you know, there's lots of disagreements in this subject. I think pretty much everyone would agree with the statement I just made. Maybe it's not true. But certainly, by an ordinary reasoning, every state in this basis has a firewall. Now, suppose that there is a projection operator onto states with firewalls, P. Since P is equal to 1 in this basis, it's 1 in every basis. That is, almost every state of the black hole in the box has a firewall. Um, now, now, in quantum mechanics, in ordinary quantum mechanics, such projectors exist. If I were talking about some set of excitations in this room, or above empty ADS, or even outside that black hole, rather than inside that black hole, there would be a projection operator onto whether they're excited or not, onto whether their total energy was greater than some value. But inside the black hole, there is not. And so we, 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 have to, we need different rules inside. Now, now, some of the defenders of quantum mechanics would say at this point, well, changing the rules of quantum mechanics sharply at the horizon is, is worse than a firewall. You may as well give up. I think one might take the point of view that no, 
that what is really happening is that the transition functions, the relation between the the um, observation between the quantum between the experiences of different observers um, involves again something beyond ordinary quantum mechanics. But that doesn't mean that individual observers wouldn't see the ordinary rules. And so I think we should pursue this. Obviously, if this is true, it's very important. And so we should pursue this and see see whether this this modification of quantum mechanics is a bug or a feature. And so here are the um, uh, most prominent uh, ideas which modify quantum mechanics in, in one way or another. I'm going to spend the most time on this first one, and you'll hear more about this um, from Kyriakos in the next talk. I'm spending the most time on this one because it's the most well formulated. Um, okay, so, um, so now let's start over again. And let's really try to insist that firewalls are crazy, and that if we have a black hole in a typical state, then, then, um, then there, is, there is no firewall. There's infalling vacuum. And, and you can actually get pretty far in the following way. So here's a typical state. And I, I, so I, I've separated the Hilbert space here um, into, into the out, some set of outgoing modes again, capital B and everything else, and everything else, V star, is mostly degrees of freedom inside the black hole. And so, and, and what, um, and for in typical states, in typical states, um, the, the dist and by typical I mean again, sort of har random states in the Hilbert space, almost all of them, in typical states, the distribution of these external modes V is thermal. So you have amplitude to be empty, and an amplitude to be full uh, with a thermal factor. Because they asked us to use large fonts, I simplified some equations. And this one in particular, I should have actually a product over all the modes, V sub i. Um, but I've just written one of them, and I've made it a fermion. So there's only 0 and 1. But that's just to make the equation look simpler. OK, so this is what, this is what a typical state of a, thermal, of, a, of, a, of a chaotic thermal system will look like the distribution of any subsystem like the modes B will be thermal. Now, if we compare this with, and, 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 and so each, the empty, mode, the empty states of state of B and the full state of B is paired with some state of the rest that I've given this name. Um, now, compare this with what does the infalling vacuum look like? And again, it's an entangled state of B and B prime, just the same weights. And so it seems as though we can immediately identify the internal Hilbert space with the, uh, with the states that come up in this expansion here. And with this interpretation, with this interpretation, typical states are vacuum just by construction. We've enforced it, um, and there's no firewall. So, so what's the problem? How does this evade, how does this evade uh, what I already told you? And, and so one way to think about the problem is to think about this state. It's the same state, except I flip this plus sign to a minus. And, and um, now, how do we, what is this state? Well, we should, it's natural that this state looks like an excitation of this state. This is the, va this is the vacuum state that we've flipped, we've flipped a sign in, in the entanglement of, 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 of B and B prime, so we're no longer in the vacuum. We're in an excited state. That's what low energy field theory would tell us if we just flip the sign in this entangled state. But look also, this state is pretty much as typical as this state. For every state of this type, there's a state of this type. And so from that point of view, from that point of view, um, the, um, we, we should think about this by, a, a, as a, a state of a vacuum. And so the problem is that this, um, approach is in danger of giving multiple interpretations or to the same state or to, sta to the same approximate state. And so we'll talk about a way to try to get around this later on. But this is the basic issue. The way that one is, the way, the way that one is trying to um, evade the argument leads to multiple identifications of states. And, but, but once one, so if one, can, if one can, 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 can deal with this, and I'll describe how you might do it later on, then basically you've, you've, you've identified the inside states. From this you can construct inside operators. And from this you can construct 
these projection operators I was talking about onto the levels of excitation of the mode seen by an infalling observer. Um, and all seems well. However, again, this um, the construction always involves this reference state. In particular, in particular, if we use this as the reference state, then this is an excited state. But we could also use this as a reference state in its own right, in which case it's not excited. And um, so you need a prescription. If I give you the black hole in some state, you need a prescription for what reference state you're going to use. And the only information you have is the, the state that I gave you. And so this reference state has to, in some way, be specified as, as a, a um, It has to be specified as a function of the state psi, and now these, proje these projection operators become nonlinear operators. They become, they become um, functions of psi. And now this is a violation of the Born rule. The Born rule for probabilities is, is no longer satisfied. And although you might, th this, 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 is, this state dependence is sometimes conflated with no more normal notions of background independence. Um, um, but it's different. So, so let me go back and um, talk a little bit about quantum mechanics. So yesterday you got a lesson on the scientific method. Today you get a lesson on quantum mechanics. <laughs> um, so, so, um, so, so in ordinary quantum mechanics we have a system in some state and we have some set of basis states. The probability of finding uh, the system state in a particular basis state is, as usual, the overlap squared, which can be written in terms of projection operator. Now, if we want to know whether a given excitation is present, then we would, su we would simply sum this over all states in which that excitation is present. And now, if we're, talking about, if we're talking about an excitation in the presence of a black hole, then we'd also have to put in the specification of the background, the fact that there's a black hole there, but that all goes into specifying the state S. And so, and so um, it all fits into this framework where probabilities are, are quadratic in the wave function or, or linear in the density matrix for the system. And, and so this is ordinary background dependence. It all sits within the usual framework of the, the Born rule. But now, in the um, approach I just described, P sub s becomes a function. Oops, P sub s becomes a function of of psi, um, and, and so now uh, probabilities are no longer quadratic in the wave function; they are nonlinear in the wave function. And and I, I don't know of anywhere in quantum mechanics where that normally happens. OK. Um, we, can, we can talk about more detailed issues. Um, so again, um, when you start modifying quantum mechanics, you have to think about a lot of questions, a lot of questions to make sure that you have consistent answers. Oh, first of all, this state, which is my problem state, is not quite typical. So this is the out that PNR use. It's not quite typical. There are small corrections to the state in order that it be typical. And, and with, with some assumptions, for any state, one can find a unitary, unique unitary, such that u psi is an equilibrium state. And if that's true, then you can complete the prescription by saying that u psi is the reference that you need to, to, to um, analyze psi. But, but again, it's nonlinear it's non in the way I've just described. But there are, you know, there's lots of odd things here. Because this state is very close to typical, it means there are pairs of states uh, whose physical interpretations are orthogonal. Um, one is vacuum and one is excited, yet their overlap as state vectors is one to high accuracy, and maybe even one exactly. This depends on details uh, that I'm not going to go into, but maybe the next speaker will. And then you have to ask, how do you interpret superpositions? There's no natural interpretation. Actually, um, if you feed this into the PR expression, so, so again, what is, the, what is the probability that this is excited? If you feed this into the PR expression, you get a very complicated thing. It's no simple function of alpha and beta. 
there is one unitary for this state, there is one unitary for this state. If you feed it in the sum, there's a third unitary which is related to the first two unitaries in no simple way. And so there's no simple answer to this. It gets even harder if you entangle the, um, this system with, with some external measurement system like a spin. Uh, how do you, what is the probability of excitation? So again, the question is if you jump in, what is the probability that you see an excitation? Here, if you jump in, what is the probability you see an excitation? And, and this, the, one of the, with ordinary quantum mechanics, it wouldn't matter if we write the state this way or this way. These are the same state. I've just used different bases for my detector spin. With ordinary quantum mechanics, of course, you would get the same probabilities with this way of writing the state and this way of writing the state. Uh, but with this machinery, you seem to get different answers. Again, because all of the things that we're used to with quantum mechanics, we have to go back and check. And, and by the way, um, so there's a, this, this construction with code subspaces, which is supposed to answer some questions of this type, but it just exactly doesn't answer this question because these two states, which are physically distinct but mathematically nearly parallel, uh, can't exist in the same code subspace. So there's the broad modification of quantum mechanics, and there's the things you've got to think about when you, when you um, 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 try to implement it in detail. Um, Nomura and collaborators um, have been pursuing similar approaches, but and they claim they can do it in a state-independent way, but at least their first model uh, had non-unitary evolution. And I think that it's not something that's going to be easily revised away. Um, another issue which has been raised, this, this, this equilibrium state proposal for, for, for figuring out which reference state you use, um, which reference state you use, um, doesn't answer lots of questions. In particular, it's, it's, it's um, tuned to work for black holes in a, in a box, but an evaporating black hole, the Hawking radiation, is very far from equilibrium. As the black hole evaporates, that's a non-equilibrium process. The, it, it's, um, it's really very far, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's um, and so this, this prescription says, has nothing, at least in its current form. Um, I, there's a possible alternative that comes to mind. Rather than using the equilibrium state as the prescription for the reference state, maybe there, this, the, the reference state has, it, it, is specified by its own dynamical evolution equation. Um, and the intuition that goes in here is, is, again, one of the PR intuitions that if you have a black hole that has not been disturbed for a while, um, then it should have a smooth horizon. And so now this, the, the interior state of the black hole is a function of both the system state and the reference state. There are degrees of freedom that record the history of the black hole um, that are that are not visible to an exterior observer. And that seems strange, but it comes up in other, in other questions, as I'll get back to. It still modifies quantum mechanics. Um, I'm dwelling on this top, so I'm, I'm dwelling on this for such a long time because it really shows if you take as a postulate there are no firewalls and pursue it, it shows you, and, and you pursue it very, you know, very energetically the way P and R have, it shows you the issues that you're led to. Okay, so uh, I'll be much briefer with the other modifications of quantum mechanics. So um, a nice observation, it goes a long ways back, is if you have a, an eternal two-sided black hole in the Hartle-Hawking state, then the geometry holographically calculates correlators in a particular entangled state of the, uh, the two sides, um, the, the thermal field state. Um, here's a nice equation in a subject that doesn't have enough equations. And so um, in the, uh, the, the, the slogan for, for uh, this is that ER, the existence of this Einstein-Rosen bridge, implies entanglement, EPR. And the question is, is this an identity? Does it go in the other way? If we prepare the thermal field state by some very complicated route, like starting with one black hole, laying it half decay, capturing the Hawking radiation and carrying out a quantum computation to put that into, to put the combines, to put that into a second black hole, which together are in the thermal field state, do we in some way build a bridge between those two black holes? Or does the interior depend on, 
the extra degrees of freedom uh, that are not visible in the CFTs, as was proposed by Morrell and Wolf, actually, even earlier. Um, that's the issue. I'm not going to say much about this, uh, except the following. If you, if you, what this approach needs is more machinery. Um, it needs to answer the question, what does an observer, given this, the combined system in any given state, what does an observer who jumps into one side see? And again, if you, if you want to argue that for this two-sided state, the typical states uh, do not have firewalls, then it, you're going to be led to the same exercise I just described. You're going to be led to basically the PR proposal. Although there's an additional problem, which is that there's no natural identification between the times in the two CFTs. And so if you have on the one side someone who sends a message, does the, reverse, does the inverse computation, sends a different message, you, there's, there's no natural way to identify uh, what's done on the left to what's seen on the right. Um, Susskind and Stanford have recently been exploring a different interpretation here, uh, which, would, which, which, which emphasizes a new ingredient, the complexity of states. And, and um, which, in which hard typical, it's very interesting that, there, that, again, that there are some sort of things that work. Hard typical states might have firewalls, but states of low complexity would not. Does this evade the, the firewall argument? It's not clear. It still is nonlinear quantum mechanics. Now, um, another modification is the final state boundary condition. So a very appealing idea, although it's one of those ideas which is appealing at first and it gets complicated when you try to work it out is that the way that information escapes is that it effectively bounces off the horizon, that there is some definite final state there, as we would expect there would be a definite initial state, um, if you had an initial singularity, and that probabilities would be calculated subject to a projection onto a definite final state there. And so the kind of the picture is, is, is like this, where this is the final state projection. And with this, you get, in effect, both entanglements you need. You have the entanglement between um, the, the um, this, this is what Stanford calls B prime, A, they call it A. So you have entanglement between B and B prime. And you also have the necessary entanglement between what I called E and B by following this through. And so the, the, basically the entanglement is quantum teleported uh, at the singularity. And so you have both necessary entanglements. But now, of course, uh, you have this weird final state boundary condition. Um, and, and one issue with this is that um, you know, it's hard to make sense of the observation of an, of an inside observer. And secondly, um, and, and this has not yet been published. It's going to appear in a revised version, uh, a claim that the a, so, so a final state boundary condition makes you think that things are acausal a claim that the a-causality would even be visible outside the black hole. That, what, what, that this earlier measurement of the entanglement between the outside, um, outside quanta uh, depends on whether someone later jumps in and measures the inside quantum. And um, now, this, 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 this may only reach a little ways outside the black hole, although using the machinery of precursors, with additional assumptions, if you use the machinery of precursors, uh, you can pull this A causality all the way back to this conformal field theory, which I think we would agree is not a good thing. So um, that's the, what's happening here. Um, there's the idea that you can't do the AMPS uh, thought experiment in its original form um, because um, you can't calculate fast enough. You can't compute fast enough. Um, it's not clear what, it, what, what this says about the second form of, of the paradox, the one with the, the basis. Um, but, but you can evade this by putting your black hole in an NFS hitter box if you are allowed to do this. And you can also, it's been argued, evade this by doing your computation early before you make the black hole so there's not really a time limit. And um, again, with, with, with all of these scenarios, um, you can try to make assumptions that keep them alive. 
But there's a bigger question maybe, which is, um, if this were true, if this were how things are evaded, what does it mean that, what does it mean? It seems to mean that there's an uncertainty principle for the wave function. Be, you know, you, what, you, and then this brings up a broader question. So this is, this is <coughs> now moving on in my last few minutes to uh, other, other approaches. But um, what you're seeing in this subject is scenarios. And the first goal is simply a consistent scenario, uh, either with or without firewalls. But the bigger goal, of course, is to have a complete theory of quantum gravity that gives rise to the scenario. So, you know, the firewall paradox, I should mention, really started with an attempt to build models of black hole complementarity, and only after failing, only after failing, uh, did it become a theorem. And, and, and again, it's one, it's one thing to evade the theorem, it's another thing to really have a, a framework that you believe is, is fundamental. Another general lesson is the impotence of ADS-CFT. Um, you know, we've used it a few times to put the system in a box, but we've used it in a funny way. We've really only used it to talk about things outside the black hole. For example, it can be used to justify the statement that typical states um, have a thermal distribution for the Hawking modes. Um, but to push inside, we've always used effective field theory near the horizon. Now, now, and this is generally true, the Sharp dictionary for ADS-CFT is always in terms either of things at the boundary or maybe things at time equals plus and minus infinity. And as we try to go further into the bulk, you're always sort of following these inward and assuming you understand the dynamics. Um, but for modes behind the horizon, we can't even sort of build precursors because to build precursors, you kind of have to integrate the mode to the boundary. And if you integrate it forward, you hit the singularity. And if you integrate it back, you hit the, the, um, the infalling star. This is a collapsing black hole with trans Planckian energy, and you don't know how to go further. In fact, if we could construct this mode operator in the CFT, then we could construct this, this projection operator I was talking about onto firewall states. And therefore, by the argument I gave earlier, there would be firewalls. So the inability to construct this, this to identify, to construct this mode in the CFT actually protects you from firewalls, uh, potentially. So, so um, what to give up? Um, so the original AMPS argument had three explicit assumptions, that the Hawking radiation is pure, that the inflowing observer sees no drama, and that physics looks sort of local outside. There was a, a fourth implicit assumption uh, that quantum mechanics uh, holds for the inflowing observer. And so which of these are, going, are you going to give up? I'm, I'm not sure which is the null hypothesis. But, um, <laughs> but as I've discussed so far, most, most of the energy in this subject has gone into the implicit assumption uh, that, that in the AMPS argument. Um, now, looking at the other three, um, I don't think there's much to say about this. There were reasons to object to this even before ADS-CFT, and I think gauge gravity duality is, is pretty clear on this subject. Um, now, I have to say that it originally seemed plausible to me that what would break down would be the, the, the exact locality outside the black hole. After all, if physics is non-local, there's no reason that should be confined to the, the interior of the black hole. But it turns out very quickly this is not easy. Um, in particular, you need, it's, as, I, as I emphasized with the, two, with the page curve and the Hawking curve, you need an order one effect. You need not a small, subtle violation of locality. You need an order one violation of locality. Very few people have been pursuing this, really only Giddings, and yet it seems like it should be thought about. But let me give you sort of a characteristic example of what you need and also what its problem is. Well, so, so here's a model that, that solves the problem. Um, so so, so that you, the black hole evaporates as the, as the photon travels away from the black hole. When it reaches some, some radius, maybe twice the Schwarzschild radius, this mode B is teleported back into the black hole, and a new mode, an imposter, appears. Um, and this new mode, the mode that was, was teleported back was the one entangled with the black hole. A new mode appears, which is entangled with the earlier radiation. So there's an actual 
in this way, transfer of entanglement. Everybody's happy. The inflowing observer sees mode B, and therefore, no firewall. The asymptotic observer sees B out, and therefore, therefore, a pure state. But of course, you need to explain what's happened here. It doesn't have to be sharp. It could be happening gra gradually. But the basic problem is that um, you, you can still defeat this, because the, qu course, the question is, what happens if you do a measurement, some kind of experiment in here? And in fact, using this, you can, you can pump information, using this, this teleportation, you can pump information into the black hole without pumping energy in. And that leads to information loss. So, so besides, thank you, their implausibility, besides their implausibility, um, the, it's actually hard to make these, these kind of ideas work. So finally, um, let's face up to the possibility that we can't get rid of the firewalls and ask, my gosh, how can a, something appear in a place where the geometry is smooth, the past is not so dramatic, what can be happening? And, and I'll mention a couple of ideas. Neither of them is, well, at this point, um, I'll mention a couple of ideas. So here's the first. Um, so, you know, we, what, so the horizon is not locally special. Uh, of course, it's future special. It's the point of no return. It's defined, the event horizon is defined in terms of the, the future of the evolution. But in fact, the past the horizon is also, the, at least the imperative horizon is also past special because in some sense it has a long history and, um, and um, in particular, there is a trans planckian boost between the horizon at late times and the, the infalling um, star that created the black hole, which I mentioned a couple slides ago. And maybe strings, maybe strings are sensitive to this non-local large quantity. This idea has been mentioned over the years. Uh, Silverstein has has recently explored it in an interesting way using a pair of D-brains, one representing the collapsing star, one at large boost representing um, a late observer, and finds evidence for non-adiabatic string production at the horizon. Um, I'd like to understand this from other points of view. For example, from what we'd call the nice slice point of view, where, um, where um, you know, where you look at the evolutions, how does this build up, how does this build up as you evolve forward in time? But of course, we're all used to the idea of stringy geometry, mostly it's studied in the Euclidean context, um, but, but, but things are more interesting and more complicated in the Lorentzian world, and, 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 and it's, it's interesting to explore this possibility uh, that, that, string, that this theory you're all working on, string theory, uh, will we'll come in and solve the problem. And indeed, in this last, in this last section, rather than just um, making scenarios, we're trying to use explicit stringy ingredient. And the other one, of course, is a longstanding program, um, the, the fuzzball. And I'm, I have no broad comments here, but I want to use my last three minutes to describe uh, a little bit of my own work. Um, and it's the it just asks the following question. So, so um, if you have the, the so-called two-charge fuzzball, the simplest one, its naive geometry is the D1, D5 brain metric. Um, and when, when Y, this spatial coordinate is non-compact, this, this, this goes over in, in, at small r to ADS3 cross S3 cross D4, a perfectly good smooth geometry that we all trust, even past the horizon, r equals zero is the horizon, x equals zero here is a horizon. Uh, but when y is periodic, then x equals zero becomes a cusp singularity. According to the fuzzball program, and I just listed one review here rather than the extensive literature, this, this, this geometry with y identified is not an acceptable string geometry and has to be, has to be um, replaced by uh, fuzzball geometry. And I'd like to understand what's wrong with this geometry. And if you look at this, and actually let me rewrite it, let me rewrite it uh, in the near horizon form. As you, as you go down towards the r equals zero uh, singularity, um, the first thing that happens is that the, the y circle gets, becomes small, eventually becomes substringy. And then, you, of course, you know you no longer can trust the 2b geometry, but it suggests that you t-dual to a 2a geometry. 
And you can then go a little further towards the singularity, but the coupling gets big. And of course, we know what happens when the coupling gets big. We lift to M theory, and you go a little bit further. And then the four torus gets small, and another set of, um, of, of dualities takes you to two. I think that was supposed to be a prime, not an exclamation point. But no, I guess I wanted an exclamation point. Anyway, takes you back to 2B. And again, you have a, a good geometric description. But finally, finally, in this last description, the curvature gets big. Uh, when the curvature gets big, duality can't save you anymore. But also, the coupling is getting small. And we actually know from other contexts, when you have a brain system where the curvature is growing, but the coupling is going to zero, you should look for a free CFT dual. And indeed, indeed, you can seemingly find one. This analysis, by the way, is exactly as is done for non-conformal brains. For example, in this classic paper, um, I'm not sure that it, that it uh, I don't think it's ever been done for the D1, D5 system. But here is the sort of the, 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 the onion shell of the, um, the, the structure. And um, if you ask about the fuzzball geom program now, the fuzzball geometries have a typical size at about just at exactly this crossover from the last supergravity picture to the, the um, free CFT. And um, now, now, and so they're, they're, really on the, they're really on the edge of the breakdown. And this is widely known. It's, it's widely known. In fact, it's kind of amusing because this system is usually studied first by, by moving around on the moduli space to a uh, fundamental string momentum system at large R. It's interesting that the natural evolution of the geometry ends up taking you to the same point, even if you start with D1, D5. But it's widely known. That, that the fuzzballs live right at the breakdown of supergravity, so they're not really trustworthy solutions. And a fair amount of, of effort goes into comparing sort of these alpha prime size fuzzballs with alpha prime size black holes. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I'd like to, I'd like to um, talk about things which are parametrically good and so not try to make sense of these alpha prime size things. Um, you can still ask which is better, the naive geometry of the fuzzballs. Uh, you might try to answer the fuzzballs because they keep track of individual microstates, but that's not really true because there's a twist operator that mixes them with a, with a, at a rate of order one. Now, there's a third radius, which also coincides with these two, which we call the entropy radius, uh, which is simply the radius at which a shell would give you a Bekstein Hawking entropy equal to the known microscopic entropy. And again, it's widely known that these three radii, the breakdown of supergravity, the radius of the fuzz, and the entropy radius, where the Bechstein Hawking entropy would put the horizon coincide. Uh, so, so we went on to look, but, and, so, but, and so that's nothing new, but we went on to look at, at, at the same system with large J, large angular momentum. And now we find that in this case, the fuzz and entropy radii are equal, but the breakdown radius can be larger or smaller. And so it seems as though there's a regime where where the fuzzballs are really well described within supergravity, and moreover, where they appear before, before the curvature becomes large. And, and you can ask, what is the signature of the breakdown of the geometry? And it's, it's this entropy radius. It's a statement that the naive geometry would tell you that as you go be closer to the, close, if, you look, if you look at sort of cylindrical shells closer to the singularity, they would have an area too small to sort of capture all the entropy of the system. And so this is a, a conjectured criterion for the breakdown of geometries. If you apply this to the Schwarzschild black hole, if you try to you know, really make a leap, uh, the entry radius is the Schwarzschild radius. And so this was intended to be an anti-fuzzball paper and ended up being kind of a one sigma pro-fuzzball paper. Um, what can you do? Anyway, that's the scientific method. So. Um, <laughs> Anyway, anyway, um, that's the end. I think after all of that, it's pointless to try to conclude except to say it's really interesting to be in a situation where there are so many ideas, all but one of which has to be wrong, if not all of them. And so um, that's where we are. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice overview. And we have time for questions.
Um, I can tell you what the null hypothesis is. Um, the null hypothesis is that not all the ingredients necessary for the firewall paradox fit into the causal patch. And in particular, if you compute the angular part of the causal patch and don't just draw the radial diagram, the outgoing Hawking modes are, are S waves, as you've said. Um, so the interior partners are also spread over the sphere, but the sphere does not fit in any causal patch. Uh, good. I don't have a, it, it might turn out to be wrong, but it, it is at least a very boring hypothesis. Yeah, I mean, so, so just as we discussed yesterday, the, the, the mining experiments which I didn't, which I didn't ex discuss would evade this because it allows you to uh, sharpen the paradox to local regions of the horizon. But even in the S-wave, I think we could argue, well, again, it's one thing to evade the paradox, another thing to sort of have a framework. But we, we can, we can well, yeah, I think even for the S-waves, there's an issue. Come on. Is it on? Yeah. My question is about uh, your, that seems like a throwaway comment that the horizon is past special. Yes. Um, that would be quite important uh, because the main counter argument against the firewall argument is that it seems a causal uh, to have suddenly a, a firewall at a place that's not right. past right. special. Uh, and indeed, I thought that if I draw the geometry, if I would fall into a black hole and I would look at my past, I would not be able to measure exactly when I'm passing through the horizon. Uh, and so, is it, can you quantify the extent to which the horizon is actually past special? You know, so I would like to do this. I mean, the, the again, in the, I, I have not done so. Um, the the um, again, one of the things, as soon as you pass the horizon, a large fraction of your geodesics, not half, but a large fraction of them, passed through the infalling star. And so, there's a sense in which um, there's a sense in which. Um, Again, you, you, you have GDs which, in, which in some heuristic sense are very long. Now, now and, and again, the, this, this, um, this setup of EVAs is, 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 turns this into a calculation. So um, I would point out, I mean, the one, again, again it's, it's, there is a question saying this in invariant, EVAs using a particular slicing. There's a question of saying this in an invariant way, which I have not done as yet. But, but that, that, that certainly, yeah. yeah but, but even if you're outside of the black hole, you know that a large fraction of your past light rays will also have passed to the there, infonic sorry. star. So, so the, the, the property that you're mentioning is also true even if you're outside of the black right. hole already. Right. So, so a property which is not, that's, 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 that's actually, instead of a collapsing star, I just consider a black hole which has been around forever. Not an internal black hole of the two-sided type, but it's just a black hole which is a equilibrium state in ADS. Then, then the statement simply is that, that a finite fraction of your geodesics um, are trapped, in, well, they, they are, you know, never, as you, if you follow them back, they never leave the black hole. They're trapped in this finite volume. So, so I mean, I, I, again, I think this is something that can, I think it's something which is concrete, but yeah, I'm not sure. Well, uh, back to lessons in quantum mechanics. Okay. You are assuming that observers obey quantum mechanics. Yes. So I guess that this implies that consciousness of living beings obey quantum mechanics. So the question is, what, how much of your uh, arguments and results would be left if it turns out that consciousness does not obey quantum Good. mechanics? So, um, I think all of this can be phrased in terms of you know, coupling to apparatus, coupling to apparati, um, rather than, than consciousness. Um, but um, certainly for measurements outside, for measurements inside, of course, your apparatus has to travel inside with you. Um, it, it's cleaner if you can couple to a pointer system, which is sort of, you know, really macroscopically. I, you know, I, I think these, I, when I, when I, when I, so, so I think these things can be phrased in the usual sort of language of, of coupling to an apparatus rather than consciousness. But of, of course, it's, it's more fun to think otherwise. Yeah. Uh, a, quest, a question about this, yes. the singularity with the shrinking circle. Yes. It seems like you mapped it to this free CFT singularity. So okay. that, does it mean that there is some higher spin dual that Good, comes good, good. In? So let me say, there, there are two, I should have, I, I, I went by that kind of fast. 
But you know, there are, just to be a, there are two free S3 CFTs that come up in this discussion. One of them is um, this orbifold CFT with, with, with D1s dissolved into D5. That's not this one. This is the long string CFT that sort of sits at the bottom of the F1. Um, but is that, so I guess, I guess you say because it's free, you, you could look for a, you could look for, well that's interesting. Again, that, that only, so again, in the spirit of, in the spirit of, 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 of holography, these different shells uh, describe um, different, different, you know, lower and lower energies. And they're not conformal. So, but, but I, that's a good question. I don't know. Hello. Yeah. In, in the whole discussion, uh, you were imagining measurements to taking place from the outside somehow. So the, the person doing the measurement was not included in the system. And so it might be that including the person in the system uh, would change this. And in particular, the quantum mechanic, the, ti the time in the interior and so on is an emergent quantity mm -hmm. probably. And so quantum mechanics uh, in the interior should also be emergent in a way that uh, might violate the usual rules. Or Good. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I'd like to, I think the second version of the paradox is a little bit more robust in that sense than the first, but that is, you know, well. Yeah, so I, I think that the paradox correctly shows yes. that uh, you cannot think of measurements in the interior as done by some objective observer mm. and on a Hilbert space, which is the Hilbert space of black hole microstates. Yeah. So. Indeed, okay, if, if, if quantum mechanics is divergent, the Born the more rule is emergent, and so, so it would, then obviously it need not be exact. Yeah. yeah I, From the gallery here. I don't see anything, so I suggest we thank Joe again for his nice overview. <laughs>